I don't know about anybody else in here, but there was a little something in that song for everybody. I mean, everybody should have been moving something. You know, I remember when I used to move like this, and I used to move like that. I remember when I used to move like this, and I used to move like that. I remember when I used to move like this, and move like that but we are in the house of the lord we are, can't even give him praise we can't even wave our hands we can't even shake our feet we can't even say amen hallelujah how many come to praise him this morning how many know that he's worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same he is worthy First, giving glory and honor to God, the creator, preserver, and ruler of the universe, and to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and to the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit that rests in the body of every believer in Jesus the Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. The Bible says let us rejoice and be glad in it. First let me give honor and thanks to our pastor in his absence for allowing me to stand before the people of God to proclaim the word of God and to our first lady in her absence we pray all is well with her and to his family and to our first lady emeritus in her absence we pray all is well for her and for all of my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and I'm gonna just say it like this I saved the best for last but I know I mentioned God first so she's gonna fall just below that amen to my lovely wife who is in the congregation this morning. I thank God for her and I thank God for her presence. And I know I got at least one amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. amen. And I, like I said the last time, if it's not externally, it's within. Amen. Amen. But I hope these words will continue to keep us in the worship mode that we're in. If you would, turn with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, <clears throat> chapter 29, verse 10 and 11. An Old Testament dispensation from the prophet Jeremiah, verse 29, chapter 29, verses 10 through 11. And I pray that you will continue to keep your Bibles open as we just refer to certain scripture in the Old and the New Testament dispensation. And I'll be re reading from the NSRV, the New Revised Standard Version, and I will also read it in the New King James Version. Verse 10, For thus saith the Lord, Only when Babylon's Seventy years are completed, will I visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. The New King James Version read, For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, will I visit you, 
and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give an expected end. I would like to use as a title or an inspirational message this morning, blessings in the midst of captivity. Blessings in the midst of captivities. My brothers and my sisters in Christ Jesus, some of us, if not most of us, and even all of us, if we are of age, have made some type of plans or have plans for our lives. We make plans for our future. We make plans for vacation. We make plans for our children to attend college. We have auto, life, home, insurance plan, and by the way, do you bundle. We have financial plans. We have retirement plans, and yes, we have even plans for our funerals. The question becomes, my brothers and my sisters, is do we make plans for God, or do we know the plan that God has for us? The plan God has for us can be found in his word. We believe that the Bible is our basic instructions before leaving earth. The Bible teaches how to live correctly and the Bible teaches us how to correct the wrongness in our lives. My brothers and sisters, the author of the book of Jeremiah is attributed to the prophet Jeremiah himself. He's one of the mouthpieces of God during the Israelite ex exile from Jerusalem into the Babylonian captivity. Many have given Jeremiah the nickname of the weeping prophet. And there are several scriptures to validate this. But my brothers and sisters, if we are to keep the nickname in its proper context, he was not weeping in the way that many believe that he was. He was not weeping and crying because of the assignment that God has called him to. He, would, he did have concern because he was of a young age when he responded to the call. But he was weeping because of the people of Israel, lack of obedience to God. They were being killed. They were offering children as sacrifices. And he was weeping and mourning for lost souls. Just to put it in a way, in Matthew 5, 4, here's what Jesus said. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Not mourning for the loss of loved one, although we mourn when we lose a loved one, but in the context is to mourn for those who are lost in sin. Those who are unsaved, losing their life to eternal damnation and separation from God. Do we as a people of God mourn for those who are unsaved? Do you mourn for those who are unsaved? Mourn for those in your families who are unsaved? Am I the only one in my family that knows somebody who is unsaved? No, I know some relatives who are unsaved. And if I have to examine some of them, I have a child who may be unsaved. But only God knows who is saved and who is not. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for those who are unsaved. Those who are lost in sin. Mourning for the lost sin. If we are mourning for lost sin. If we are mourning for the lost. How many in here will be at the next? evangelistic outreach ministry. When we come together and get organized to go out into the community to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are unsaved and though we may knock on doors who are, or those who are saved, we don't know if they're saved or not. We have to be available to use by God to go out and tell the good news, the gospel of Jesus the Christ. 
Jeremiah writes, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for your harm. To give you a future with hope. My brothers and my sisters, God has had enough. Enough of the disobedience. Enough of worshiping idols. Enough of the sacrifices of their children to idols. Enough of the false prophets that was preaching or teaching other than what thus said the Lord. In chapter 25, verses 5 through 10, God becomes judge, lawyer, witness, and juror. He hands down his indictment. He presents his case. He brings forth his judgment. And he imposes sentence upon his chosen people, the Israelites. My brothers and sisters, don't think that God will not hand down some type of judgment on us. When we are disobedient to his word. And the sentence that he gave them was 70 years. 70 years for being disobedient. And guess what? He uses Nebuchadnezzar and calls him his servant. We best know about Nebuchadnezzar when he put the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace that is found in, in the book of Daniel's chapter 3. That same person, Nebuchadnezzar, God called his servant. It's just to tell us, my brothers and sisters, God will use whomever he wishes to bring believers to a point of humility and obedience to him. You, you, you don't have to be a child of God for God to use you. It's just like we talk about 45 and how maybe he's not saved. God has elevated him to the possession, to the position of being the president of the United States in order to wake maybe myself up. He allows people to assume certain positions. And he can work through those who are saved and unsaved to fulfill his mission. But God's heart and love is still with his people. As he says through the writings of Jeremiah, For surely I know the plans I have for you. Says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your harm. To give you a future with hope. Blessings in the midst of captivity. Three points I want to quickly walk through. God's provision. God's protection. And God's promise of restoration. For surely I know the plans I have for you. Says the Lord. Plans for your welfare. God says I know. He's the sovereign God. He knows everything. He's in control of everything and every situation in our lives. Which means that God is also consistently thinking and about the welfare and the upkeep of his people. But not only is God thinking about us, God wants us to think about him. The question is, do we have the mind of Christ? Like Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind and let this mind that is in Christ Jesus be in you. Do you have the mind of Christ? Are you thinking about God 24-7? Is he at the front lip of your mind or is he at the back of your mind? Paul says it. God knows everything. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. You can't hide anything from him. You can try it, but you can't hide it. And though he allows his people to be taken into captivity, he assures them they would be cared for. That, 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 that's an awesome kind of God. He's going to confine you to captivity, and then he's going to take care of you. In chapter 29, Jeremiah writes a letter to the remaining elders and the priests, the prophets, and all the people taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. 
The letter was delivered by two couriers. And so I don't desecrate their name. I'm not going to try to pronounce them. But you can find them in chapter 29. The letter reads, Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exile whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat from them. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. That they may, be bear, that they may bear sons and daughters multiply there and do not decrease. It sounds like a captivity in the land of Egypt. Here's the contention. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray for the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, your end will be welfare. God is saying, I'm going to send you in captivity. But I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of. And when you get there, I want you to pray for those who held you in captivity. I mean, I, I, I don't know what God is trying to, trying to do or say right there, but, but, but you know, that, 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 that looks kind of fuzzy to me, that, 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 that God would was, was put me in some kind of bondage and then tell me to pray for the person that's holding me in bondage. But he said, in order for you to be blessed, you got to do what I tell you to do while you're in captivity so you can be blessed. Now, I don't know what you held hostage to. I don't know if you have, you're being held to hostage in bitterness, envy, jealousy, hatred towards others, unforgiven spirit, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and gangs, prostitution, whatever your confinement might be. I don't know what your situation is, but I know God knows what your situation is. And God is saying, even in your situation, you can pray to me. You can trust me that I'll deliver you. Now, all of us have some faults. Now, I'm not preaching up here like I ain't got no faults. I got a lot of faults. But I'm thank God he looks beyond my fault. And he sees my every need. And he raises me up. When I'm down, that he can use me to glorify his name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Some are bondage and sickness. Sickness have people captive to where they don't even try to do nothing. They don't even try to move. But I see some of the senior members coming to the church in wheelchairs, walking sticks, leaning over, coming to praise God, just coming out the hospital and say, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. My brothers and my sister, there's a song that says, no, not one. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. If you know him, you ought to tell me about him. And I'm going to tell you, you've been listening to a false preacher, a false teacher, because there's only one. And Jesus is his name. And if you want to keep it into a biblical context, it's the person of the Trinity. The second person of the Trinity. We have God, the Godhead, Jesus, the Christ, Son of God, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he always says, pray for the welfare of Babylon. And in praying for them, you will be blessed. So I had to think about that some more. And, 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 I, and I thought about being in a job situation. Because you see, sometimes I'm kind of confused about uh, 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 the, the 
the, the boss man over me. And, and sometimes I kind of think that, you know, I don't know what he thinks. But the one thing that I have to tell him sometimes, my commitment is not to you. My commitment first is to God. My next commitment is for the company that I represent. I'm not working for you. I work for the company. So what God is telling me, you do good by your company. And by you doing good by your company, your company will be blessed. And if your company is blessed, I will bless you. I never ask for a raise. Never ask for anything. I let my work speak for me. And when my work speaks for me, I cannot be denied. But not only does my work speak for me on the job, my works that I do for Christ, only what I do for Christ will last and he will bless me according to his glory and his purpose and his riches. I don't care how much money I make. Long as I got bills paid, food on my table, clothes on my back, roof over my head, transportation to drive on. Surely I want a healthy bank account, but that does not identify me. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. Not for harm. Everybody say not for harm. It talks of God's protection. He gives them warnings in verse 8. For thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie and they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. Here lies the problem with the children of Israel. We have a prophet sent by God to speak to God's people on his behalf, according to his word. A prophet who was obedient to God and telling the truth. And if they would, wouldn't turn from their disobedience, he would tell them that God will pass judgment on them. That prophet was Jeremiah. Now, on the other hand, there was, a, there was a false prophet, or many of false prophets, but one in particular by the name of Hananiah. In chapter 28, verse 2, Hananiah proclaimed that the Lord had spoke to him and said that he had broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. And within two years, remember God sentenced them to 70 years. But Hananiah said within two years... We're going to return all the vestals that was taken from Jerusalem back, uh, from Babylon back to Jerusalem. And he also said after two years, they would return back to Jerusalem. But that's not what God said. God made it plain. He said, I'm not going to even listen to you until after 70 years. But the people inclined their ears to Hananiah because he was giving them some good news, the things they wanted to hear and believe. They wanted news of prosperity and wealth. They didn't want to believe that their God would treat them so harshly by sending them captivity for 70 years, despite of their disobedience. Some people just don't believe God would discipline them. They will just continue to do the same thing over and over and over again, which really identifies if there are really, y'all fill in the blank. But, but, but God, God, God said, if you are saved, you will not continue in sin. You will not sin habitually. In other words, if you stole today, you won't steal tomorrow, the next day, the next day, and the next day, and continue that lifestyle of sin. But Jeremiah's word was rejected. And the people wanted to kill him for that. He stood on the truth and he spoke what thus said the Lord, even though his life was threatened. How many times do we hear our pastor say when he stands? I am called to preach truth. I stand on the word of God. The word of God to some is not popular. People want to hear health and wealth. 
People want to hear posterity. They don't want to hear about God's judgment. They don't want to hear about sin. They just want to hear prosperity preaching, name it and claim it, theology. Pay your tithes and God's going to bless you with 30, 60, and 100 fold. Press down, shaking together, and running over. Bring your tithes to the front at the tithes and offering, and God's going to give you triple in return. God don't say that. God's blessing comes in many different ways other than monetary blessings. He blesses with good health. He blesses her with decent children. He blesses her with a good husband and a good wife. He blesses us in a way that we can't even imagine. Even when we go through the drive through and he allows us to, bring, to buy a Happy Meal with a small drink, that's a blessing from God. You don't need a double whopper with cheese, bacon, lettuce, and all that other good stuff to know that God's blessing you. No, no, no. Give me a Happy Meal. Give me a little drink. Let me just cool my thirst. Put something in my belly. Give me the strength to carry and do God's will. Not my will. But God said, therefore thus said the Lord, I'm going to send you off. He told Hananiah. He said, I'm going to send you off the face of the earth. Within these years, you will be dead because you have spoken rebellion against the Lord. And for the rest of those who were left behind, he says to them in verse 29, uh, uh, in chapter 29, verse 16 and 17, here's what he told them. Thus said the Lord concerning the king who sits upon the throne of David and concerning all the people who live in this city, your kinfolk. You know, the one we were just talking about? Who did not go out with you into exile. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I'm going to loose on them the sword. Famine and pestilence. And I will make them rotten figs. They are, they are so bad, they cannot be eaten. Now, now I, I can't even visualize a, 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 a person being as rotten as fig. That will not even be eaten. But you know I grew up in the country. My grandmother and them had fig trees. And they used to can a lot of figs. And we as children we used to run under the trees. And we used to pick them figs and we eat them. But every now and then. We would put a rotten one in our mouth. And when that rotten one get out of our mouth. We say. Oh man I can't eat that. And we would spew it out. But God said because of your disobedience. You will be as rotten figs. And you will not be able to be eaten. God despises sin and he hates disobedience. Pastor always says to us that he's going to stand on truth. And a lot of people today don't want to hear truth. The Bible reminds us that if we don't say what does said the Lord, then the blood is on our hands. And let me just remind you, that's from a pastoral perspective, but it applies to members as well. If we don't say to our children, our family member, what thus says the Lord, and if we find themselves perishing, unsaved, the blood could be on your hands. So, so, so we see the provision of God. We see the protection of God. And finally, we see the promise of God. He said, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future without or with hope. To give you a future with hope. God's promise of restoration. The word restoration means to bring back to an original state. Back into fellowship with God. Set in order by the word of God and an act of the Holy Spirit. I kind of use... The example when one comes and say, well, I want to restore my life back unto Christ. It reminds me of an old car that's sitting in the backyard that's full of rust. And I want to restore that car. I'm not going to pull that car, put it in a paint boot and spray it and paint it up and then start driving it. Because all I'm doing is covering up the rust. 
when you restore something, you have to strip it down of all the rust. You even have to put some thin metal plates to kind of cover up some of the holes that were there. You even have to use a little bit of Bondo to smooth over some of the rough areas. And the only thing I'm saying is, if you're going to be restored by, by come for restoration, you need to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And you need to be spending some time in the Word of God so that those rusts in your life won't come back to haunt you. Says for surely I know the plan. God's promise of restoration. God's whole purpose and plan was and always is for the good of his people. His promise does come with condition. And that condition is found in verses 10 through 14. And I'm just going to say, uh, uh, he said after 70 years, I will not hear you. But then again, he says, after those 70 years, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will not let you find me, says the Lord, and I will not restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations. And all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. God is saying after the sentence of 70 years, he will incline his people to their prayer. And God hears our prayer. But if our prayer are, 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 are polluted with disobedience and, and we are saying one thing and asking God for this and asking God for that and we are living in disobedience our prayer is not even reaching the roof and God will not hear it but he will hear a sinner's prayer to repentance and if you repent turn from your wicked ways and do what thus said the Lord God will incline his ears to your prayer so my brothers and my sisters I'm glad today that through these passages of scriptures, we can see the provision of God, the protection of God, and the promise of restoration from God. We serve a God who is loving, a God who is kind, and a God who wants the best for his people. In wanting the best for us, he will allow some things to happen in our lives. In wanting the best for us, he will take us through some trials and some tribulation. Some rejections and some chastisement. Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I've spoken unto you, that in me you shall have peace. But in the world you shall have trials and tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Oh, bless his holy name. One more thing that God assured them as he says to them uh, that he will not parole them they will have to serve the entire sentence there will be no early release from this sentence he said after 70 years he will restore them what we have to realize my brothers and my sisters is that 70 years for those who are in captivity may be those who will find themselves on a deathbed 70 years for somebody that's already 70, you know, it's most unlikely that they will survive. So the promise of restoration, my brothers and sisters, is that the days of our years are three score years and ten. And by reason of strength, they are four score years. In other words, God promised us to live at least 70 years. And by his strength, his grace, and his mercy he allowed us to live until 80 but i know i got some testimony in the house of those who are 90 years old 91 years old and above and that's just the blessings of god 
So my brothers and sisters, when we look at this restoration for those who may not return as it refers to the restoration of life eternal in the promised Messiah, we have to go to Acts chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 where it says, so that the time of refreshings may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send his Messiah upon it for you that is Christ Jesus. You must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announces long ago through his prophets. In other words, if you die before these 70 years, there is still restoration in our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And he said, Jesus is now sitting on a throne in heaven, but we know that he's going to come back again. But before he comes back again, he first came down through 40 and two generations. Conceived in the womb of a virgin called Mary by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. He tabernacled there for nine whole months uh, and he stepped out in the world uh, seeing through the eyes of humanity. He walked the dusty streets of Palestine uh, and the Bible tells me he walked upon that which he used to create humanity. Y'all don't hear me. He said in Genesis, from dust thou art, thus you shall return. So my brothers and sisters, they led him down the Via Della Rosa. And he came upon some weeping women. And this is what he said to them. Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. And here comes this 70 years again. Because in 70 years, you're going to experience some hardship. You're going to experience some difficulty and you're going to experience some death. But I know the purpose from which I came. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I came that you might be saved. I came that they would lead me to a hill called Calvary. And I will allow them to lay me down and stretch me wide. Put nails in my hands and nails in my feet. I will allow them uh, to lift me up uh, and said unto them, if I be lifted up, uh, I draw all men uh, unto me. Uh, have I got a witness? Uh, ain't God all right? Do you know him? Uh, have you tried him? Uh, one Friday evening uh, between the sixth and the ninth hour, he died. Uh, didn't he die? Uh, he died one Friday evening they took him down put him in a borrowed tomb stayed there all night Friday night stayed right there all night all day Saturday he stayed there all day Saturday and all night Saturday night but I'm so glad I'm so glad bright early bright early Sunday morning rose from the grave. All power, all power, all power in his hand. Saving power, restoration power, justification power, sanctification power, glorification power. All power, all power. Any all right? Any all right? Can you say yeah? Say yeah, say yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I know he's all right. Any weather, any weather. There's something about a sweet about the Lord. There's something mighty sweet about the Lord. There's something mighty sweet about the Lord. He changed my soul and he made me whole. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Do you know him? Have you tried him? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right?
blessings in the midst of captivity. God's provision, God's protection, and God's promise of restoration. There may be someone here who's trapped in captivity. Someone that has shackles on their feet. Shackles that won't let them move. Won't let them stand. But I know a one, as he broke the yoke, the chains in Babylon, he can loosen the chain of whatever you're confined to in your life. But in order for him to do that for you, you must be. You got to be born again. So the doors of the church is open. The opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord is extended. As the choir leaders, we ask that if there is one, let them come. Come and accept the one who can provide for you. The one who can protect you. And the one who has a home not built by hands eternally in the heaven. Let them come. God loves you. He cares for you. Is there another? The doors of salvation is open. To come and have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There may be someone who's looking for a church home. We offer you to come. Amen. We've done what God have asked and there is still room. Well, didn't he preach? Did he preach? Did he preach? The word of God. Now, this is the time that all of us can smile and say glory, glory, hallelujah. Say it. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Because it's giving time. Let the ushers come. The ministers are going to lead and the choir will follow.
Shall we all stand, please?